CCP is exploiting uh, the situation to do bad things on Hong Kong people, thinking probably that the world would be too busy and otherwise engaged with fighting the uh, coronavirus that they could not spare the attention to uh, keep an eye on Hong Kong. And that is exactly why I'm telling the world that perhaps you should not do that. Uh, of course, you, you fight the uh, coronavirus, but uh, at the same time, I think people are already doing this. They are trying to um, figure out what has brought about the chaos and the um, catastrophic uh, effect on the world economy. So this, in a way, is bringing home to the world how CCP threat can manifest itself in a way that is actually lethal to peoples of the uh, liberal democratic world. It is just like an alarm clock that uh, wakes you up. With the world focused on the coronavirus pandemic, how is China's communist regime taking advantage of this crisis to expand its grip on Hong Kong? How exactly has Hong Kong managed to contain the coronavirus or CCP virus to relatively few cases? How is the Chinese leadership's encroachment on Hong Kong's rule of law and freedoms a reflection of its global ambitions? And what can we expect if the regime has its way? In this episode, we sit down with Alan Leong, a longtime proponent of Hong Kong democracy and rule of law. A former head of the Hong Kong Bar Association, he also served on the Hong Kong Legislative Council for 12 years. He currently serves as chairman of the pro-democracy Civic Party. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kelleck. Alan Leong, so great to have you back on American Thought Leaders. My pleasure. Alan, you know, we spoke uh, last December when I was in Hong Kong. Um, we had some really, really uh, fascinating discourse. And one of the things that I remember from that is that, you know, basically you were arguing that whatever the reality that Hong Kong faces from the Chinese Communist Party is actually something the world needs to look at because they're going to face that same reality. If they're not facing it now, they're going to face it sometime. Um, and that, that actually really, you know, stuck with me, a very, very profound idea. And I kind of, I want to dig into that because there's been some examples of how the CCP is using this whole, the world's focus on coronavirus to further encroach on, on you know, Hong Kong freedoms and basic law and so forth. But before we jump into that, I think this is, criti that's critical. Before we jump into that, um, I want to just find out What's the reality on the ground right now in Hong Kong? Well, uh, when we talked uh, in December, I actually used the figurative speech that uh, today's Hong Kong would be liberal democracies tomorrow. And therefore, if you are thinking that uh, you are just helping Hong Kong, that is not quite accurate because you are at the same time helping yourselves. Uh, I think this uh, coronavirus saga is bringing that message home, uh, cut and dried, uh, to liberal democracies and their peoples. In the past, liberal democracies focused on uh, the dollar sign in their eyes by doing business in China, exploiting the huge market in China. But now they know that by uh, such business dealings, they can easily be sacrificing lives. So, and of course, you know why, because there, there, there 
had been this uh, concealment of very relevant information by the CCP as to when this coronavirus first came into being uh, and how it had uh, spread, etc. So I think uh, this virus is, uh, in a way, um, awakening a lot of people in liberal democracies who had not done so before. Now, coming back to your question as to what is uh, on the ground in Hong Kong, um, insofar as this CCP virus is concerned, uh, I think we are doing reasonably well, uh, given the fact that our chief executive, Carrie Lam, had been very slow in closing the border between Hong Kong and the mainland. And there has consistently been an influx of mainlanders um, into Hong Kong. And of course, we were very anxious about this, so anxious that many of our uh, doctors and nurses, they went on strike for five days. And what they demanded was for Carrie Lam to close the border between Hong Kong and the mainland so that uh, the Hong Kong uh, uh, public health system would not collapse as a result of this huge influx of uh, people who would be uh, prone to carrying this virus with them. Uh, the, the strike uh, of the medical personnel actually resulted to a partial closure of the border uh, in the form of uh, restrictions imposed on those uh, coming into Hong Kong from the mainland, uh, requiring them to undergo a period of quarantine, um, etc. So uh, if you ask me why Hong Kong is uh, doing okay, uh, given all the uh, uh, influx of, uh, of mainlanders, I think I would give credit to the anti-extradition movement. I would also give credit to what happened in 2014 in the umbrella movement and the 79 days of occupation, uh, because from these huge uh, people's movement and the response that we had got from the CCP and from uh, the local administration, we learned this lesson, uh, albeit a very hard way, that we can't trust the CCP, we can't trust the Hong Kong government, uh, and we have to really uh, do what we can uh, as a matter of self-help. And therefore, we, we uh, tried our very best to um, get supply of uh, surgical masks. Uh, you may remember that there were about three weeks in Hong Kong, uh, beginning about mid-January uh, to early February, that you found the long queues of Hong Kong people. Uh, they, they, whenever they heard that a particular shop got some supplies of uh, uh, this surgical mask, they would uh, uh, queue up. In fact, the night before. <laughs> and so we also try to make uh, the, uh, those uh, uh, alcohol uh, wash uh, ourselves because they were short uh, in supply uh, in the market in Hong Kong uh, in, in, in January, uh, hand, hand rubbed, etc. So, uh, and also we, we, um, do, did not follow the uh, uh, suggestion 
of Carrie Lam for us not to wear masks. We um, just listen to our experts, our uh, pandemic experts, doctors, etc. So I think we owe uh, the present situation um, that we are doing not as bad as it could have been. Uh, we owe it to these uh, huge people's movement and the lesson that we learn from them. Well, you know, it's it's very interesting that you mention, uh, uh, you know, Taiwan and Hong Kong and so forth, because Taiwan, of course, is also, you know, arguably doing model work uh, around trying to deal with the uh, with the pandemic. And one of the things that that they the, they were in an unusual situation in that they didn't even have access to the WHO information, which we're now learning was, you know, by all accounts, basically fed directly from the CCP. So the WHO was credulous to the to the CCP and, you know, other countries, say the U.S. and so forth, were credulous to the WHO. Meanwhile, Taiwan didn't have access. And second of all, of course, didn't trust what the CCP was saying either for perhaps similar reasons to, to, to Hong Kong that you were mentioning. So, I mean, this is kind of a trusting the CCP, anyone who did that seems to have fared very, very poorly. I think uh, when, when you uh, likened Hong Kong uh, to Taiwan uh, in how we are faring in this uh, uh, war against the CCP virus, uh, you are making a very apt uh, analogy here. Uh, well, Taiwan is not a member of WHO, and that is, of course, a blessing, it, as it turns out, because Taiwan would not have to listen to Dr. Tedros. Because Dr. Tedros was saying and telling the world, <laughs> I think uh, America actually suffered as a result of uh, trusting Dr. Tedros at the WHO, that you, um, you believed that uh, this CCP virus was actually controllable and uh, it would not spread like uh, wildfire as it uh, is now spreading. So I think uh, what is common between Hong Kong and Taiwan is that we did not trust the WHO uh, we did not trust the CCP for uh, the information that they provided. Uh, and we, of course, Hong Kong uh, also experienced about 20 years ago this SARS epidemic. And so we are sort of uh, uh, quite tuned to uh, wearing surgical masks so as to protect ourselves and protect others, protect our neighbors. Uh, I think it is this uh, mentality uh, and not trusting uh, CCP or the WHO that uh, put us in our present situation. So recently we've had uh, Dr. Tedros, uh, the head of the World Health Organization, accusing Taiwan of actually being racist towards his person. And actually this idea of racism uh, has been used by uh, Chinese officials and spokespeople as well uh, when uh, American officials were saying that the virus originated in China. I'm wondering if you could speak to this. Well, this issue or talk about racism in the context of the coronavirus, to me is really a red herring. Uh, it has directed attention uh, in a wrong direction, and if we follow that direction, we are going off on a tangent. Uh, the CCP has the um, history of playing up nationalism whenever they are in deep trouble. And uh, so, this is uh, a, a tactic that uh, the CCP uh, is used to deploying. And talking about Dr. Tedros, um, uh, firstly, uh, it has been found out that uh, all the attacks on him uh, 
which apparently originated from Taiwan, had uh, been created by uh, mainland netizens. Uh, and secondly, I think uh, Dr. Tedros missed the point. When the world has been complaining that the WHO has become the China Health Organization by concealing uh, very material and relevant information, uh, which if the world had known it in a timely manner, could have prevented over 90% of the spread of the virus. Now, this is really the point that uh, uh, Dr. Tedros ought to be addressing. But I know why he was playing up this uh, racism card, because he doesn't have an answer to what should always have been the question. You know, uh, speaking about the WHO, there is uh, this situation now where the R RTHK reporter, um, you know, did the interview with the WHO official, um, which of course, which went viral subsequently because the official wasn't going to speak about Taiwan unless uh, as a part of China. Um, but this is actually the, the administration is coming down on RTHK right now with respect to this. Can you yeah. speak to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, I can uh, generally describe uh, the Hong Kong situation as follows. I think the CCP and its agent, uh, namely Carrie Lam, the chief executive in Hong Kong, are exploiting the, um, the public health uh, situation to do some very bad things. And there are a few of these bad things. Uh, for example, there are talks about uh, making national security laws as soon as possible. Uh, you remember that they failed to do so in the year 2003. Uh, but now people are jumping at it and suggest that this may be time to do it. Another thing is that uh, they uh, started arresting people for sedition, which is uh, something that uh, we uh, lawyers see to be a crime that aims at silencing uh, dissidents and um, the dissent. Uh, also, there are uh, talks about uh, cancelling or at least postponing the September Legislative Council elections, uh, which of course is a very grave matter because you are taking away Hong Kongers' right to vote, which is protected by the International Covenant, uh, human rights and political rights, you see. And also without this right to vote, you are actually forcing people to use uh, uh, force or violence because this is the the the, the uh, really most uh, uh, civilized uh, and rational way to manifest uh, your uh, uh, political positions. Uh, and the fourth matter on my list is, of course, the the thing that you just mentioned. Uh, Radio Television Hong Kong, uh, generally known as RTHK, is of course a public broadcaster in Hong Kong. Uh, it is um, uh, a government department uh, under the uh, uh, control of the Secretary for Commerce and um, uh, Economic Development. Uh, and we, I mean, Hong Kong people have been watching RTHK for at least 
three to four decades. And we like in particular uh, the way that uh, the RTHK has put together programs uh, that are satirical of the administration. Uh, we like the political satires uh, that uh, this public broadcaster has been introducing. And there was this recent incident that a reporter of RTHK got herself uh, this opportunity to um, interview online uh, on the internet the Deputy Secretary General of WHO. And the question asked by this uh, female reporter of uh, the Deputy Secretary General was just that, sir, uh, would you consider Taiwan for membership of WHO? And the uh, Deputy uh, Secretary General uh, suddenly cut the, the line, right? Uh, as if there were a signal failure. Right? And when he came back on, the reporter asked the question again, and he simply refused uh, to meet it head on. Uh, so that was the background. And the uh, policy secretary, Edward Yao, in charge of uh, RTHK, that is the Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development, right? uh, this uh, reporter's boss, so to speak, uh, suddenly came out in a high profile to allege that uh, this reporter, by asking that question about Taiwan membership uh, to be considered by WHO, is in fact uh, going against and breaching the one China principle. Now this is, but to me, is quite ridiculous. Um, and there have been talks about uh, the government coming down on this public broadcaster like tons of bricks. And obviously they do not like the way that RTHK uh, has been putting together all these programs uh, which were so popular that make the administration and the CCP most embarrassed. So there are these few matters that it seems that the CCP and the um, Hong Kong uh, administration are exploiting uh, the, the uh, 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 public health issue uh, in the form of the CCP virus uh, attacking Hong Kong uh, to do many bad things. So, Alan, this is really interesting uh, because you're basically saying they're not just attacking um, RTHK for saying this, for basically for the reporter suggesting that Taiwan might be independent. At least I think I guess that's their argument. But they're actually using this whole scenario you're suggesting as a hook to encroach on RTHK's independence altogether. Am I reading that right? Well, uh, this reporter's uh, incident is not uh, just a singular incident that uh, uh, suggests uh, the administration is uh, coming down on this public broadcaster. Uh, there are other uh, um, things happening at the same time. Uh, for example, uh, they, uh, I mean, the administration was alleging that the RTHK in a uh, political satire was um, ridiculing the police to such an extent that uh, they misled the public into believing that the police was not doing their job properly. And by making this accusation, the administration actually asked the RTHK um, director uh, to uh, submit a uh, report on the incident, uh, 
uh, and kicking up a big fuss about it. And pro-Beijing uh, and pro-government legislators in the Legislative Council uh, were actually suggesting that perhaps they would cut the budget for uh, RTHK in the coming financial year, just to teach it a lesson. Now, all these things are happening at the same time. And this reporter asking the question of uh, the Deputy Secretary General of WHO uh, is only one of the few instances that uh, we, we feel uh, are instances uh, that could bear witness to the administration coming, going after RTHK. Oh, that's, that's fascinating and frankly uh, very disturbing. You know, the other uh, thing you mentioned was this example of sedition using uh, the accusation of sedition. Um, I'm wondering if you could explain that a little bit. During the uh, anti-extradition uh, law saga, uh, there was a reporter from Indonesia reporting the uh, movement in Hong Kong. And on one occasion, there was an encounter between this uh, reporter from Indonesia and the riot police. Uh, and her one of her eyes was actually blinded as a result of uh, uh, the police firing at her. Now, uh, and there was a Democrat uh, who uh, was the chairman of one of the district councils in Hong Kong, who posted on her Facebook uh, the picture of this police officer traced by uh, people on the internet to be the culprit who actually had fired on the Indonesian journalist, uh, causing one of her eyes to be blinded. And the police arrested her, arrested this uh, Democrat uh, uh, district council chairman, and investigated her for uh, a possible offense of sedition. Now, to all lawyers trained in the common law, we know that sedition is a political offense. First came into being, I think, in the 17th century, um, uh, when the British monarch was using this to silence uh, the dissidents and any dissenting voices. Uh, so it is a, an archaic uh, offense, common law offense, uh, that ought to have no place in modern day Hong Kong when we are protected by the two international covenants or human rights and also our own uh, uh, human rights uh, ordinance. So uh, this uh, proposed invocation of uh, this uh, archaic uh, offense of sedition, again, uh, is a, a move in the wrong direction. Uh, to us, it seems that the CCP and the uh, Hong Kong uh, administration are trying to uh, really silence any dissenting voice uh, that eats into uh, freedom of uh, expression uh, uh, and freedom of speech. And that is a great matter. You know, and you actually mentioned that people are talking about reintroducing the national security law. I guess it was Article 23 back in the day. I mean, this was what created the original uh, mass protests in the first place. Right, because it would separate, uh, or it would uh, not not separate. It would remove the separation of uh, Hong Kong, the Hong Kong legal system, from the 
uh, among other things, from the mainland. Um, so wait, so right now there's people saying that, that, that this should come back? Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, the uh, 1st of July, 2003, saw uh, the first uh, 500,000 people march on on Hong Kong Island's streets uh, in recent years. In fact, it started uh, what I would describe as a social awakening uh, of Hong Kong civil society. Uh, at that time, uh, Hong Kong was under Tong Chi Hua, our first chief executive, and the secretary for uh, security was then Regina Yeo who, of course, is now a legislator and chair lady of uh, the New People's Party. Uh, and Article 23 of the Basic Law actually obliges Hong Kong uh, to make uh, national security laws to deal with a grave uh, offences like uh, treason, um, uh, breach of state secret, uh, sedition, uh, etc. Uh, and of course, you know that if we are in to the realm of national security laws, there are bound to be some sacrifices on human rights and um, and uh, freedoms. And at that time. Uh, I was chairman of the Hong Kong Bar Association, and we put out a very uh, strong position paper to argue that if Hong Kong made uh, the national security laws in the way that the chief executive uh, uh, were, were, was then proposing, then Hong Kong's rule of law as an institution would be uh, very much harmed and damaged. And Quite obviously, we persuaded quite a few uh, Hong Kong people that that would be the case. And there was this huge march on the 1st of July, 2003, which resulted in the National Security Bill uh, having been shelved by the chief executive, and it has never come back since. And just about uh, I think a fortnight ago, there were more than one uh, voices in Hong Kong uh, from both the uh, legislative council circle and the Beijing camp arguing that, uh, well, it is high time that we made uh, laws to uh, deal with the um, treason, breach of state secret, etc., uh, because that had been uh, all that uh, was causing the trouble in Hong Kong. Uh, so that is also a very dangerous sign. We may be uh, seeing a further deteriora deterioration of the Hong Kong uh, rule of law uh, and respect for freedoms and human rights. Uh, while on that, perhaps you can allow me to also uh, mention that um, the uh, statements made by quite a few pro-Beijing figures uh, on an occasion that marked the 30th anniversary of the promulgation of the Basic Law actually made me very anxious. Uh, the Basic Law was promulgated on uh, the 4th of April, 1990. So came the 4th of April, 2020, uh, we uh, are looking at the 30th anniversary. Uh, and these pro Beijing figures were telling Hong Kong that, oh, uh, you had been mistaken about your interpretation of the basic law. When you said, oh, you had been promised high degree of autonomy, uh, your freedoms, 
uh, and your human rights would remain intact, your uh, legal system and the rule of law as an institution would be uh, preserved until at least 2047. That was a mistake. Uh, in fact, I can tell you now that the CCP has all along um, retained the absolute power over Hong Kong. And you must read the basic law in a correct way. Now, this is really something that I can't swallow. You see, uh, and well, given these very clear uh, statements, I think it is fair for me to conclude <laughs> that uh, the on this 30th anniversary, I can say that the past 30 years actually tell a tale of treachery and deceit. So they are actually saying, well, uh, look here, chaps, um, you thought that you had been promised uh, universal suffrage. You thought that you had been promised uh, preservation of freedoms, uh, human rights, and the rule of law as an institution. You are mistaken. Now, how can anybody who is responsible say something like that. Now, it is just like you have deceived Hong Kong people and now turning round to accuse us of being so foolish as to have been deceived by you. Now, this is really something. Uh, but it seems that this is the CCP that we are facing today. And coming back to where you began, Yen, uh, I said today's Hong Kong can easily be the world's tomorrow. Now, if the CCP is uh, giving us this story of treachery and deceit uh, in, in not uh, respecting uh, the basic law and all the promises enshrined in it, then the CCP in its true colors is actually revealed uh, to the world uh, really uh, very clearly. And so when I, when I told uh, your audience uh, back in December that uh, you, meaning liberal democracies of the world, are standing with Hong Kong to fight for our freedom, that is not only you helping us to fight our uh, uh, war, uh, our, our battle against encroachment of freedoms uh, and human rights and rule of law. We are also defending yourselves because we are both sharing the same core values, ideologies and institutions. Uh, of liberal democracies of the world, and we are facing the same threat, namely the CCP threat. And what happens on the ground in Hong Kong uh, should uh, bring home to you loudly and clearly what you might be facing in time to come. To, to sum up um, this, the how much of an increased threat do you see amidst coronavirus uh, from the CCP in its plight basically to uh, encroach further on uh, the freedoms of Hong Kong and control it? No, uh, what I see happening on the ground in Hong Kong uh, while we are uh, defending ourselves against this uh, virus is that CCP is exploiting uh, the situation to do bad things on Hong Kong people, thinking probably that the world would be too busy 
and otherwise engaged with fighting the uh, coronavirus that they could not spare the attention to uh, keep an eye on Hong Kong. And that is exactly why I'm telling the world that perhaps you should not do that. Uh, of course, you, you fight the uh, coronavirus, but uh, at the same time, I think people are already doing this. They are trying to um, figure out what has brought about the chaos and the um, catastrophic uh, effect on the world economy. Uh, an accusing finger, of course, is being pointed at the CCP, particularly in the form that uh, it had chosen to conceal the uh, coronavirus when it was first uh, uh, reported uh, in uh, Wuhan. And also, uh, it had uh, produced figures that were not trustworthy so that the world uh, did not have an accurate assessment as to what possible impact this coronavirus could have and the catastrophic uh, results that it could produce. Um, so this, in a way, is bringing home to the world how CCP threat can manifest itself in a way that is actually lethal to peoples of the uh, liberal democratic world. Uh, it is in this way that uh, I think this uh, CCP virus is highly relevant to uh, the world's awakening to the CCP threat, it is just like an alarm clock that uh, wakes you up. And uh, this uh, CCP virus uh, is really um, so uh, persuasive that uh, you can't continue to sleep on it. Uh, you, you, you are now awakened and you have to find a way uh, to deal with the CCP in the aftermath of uh, the uh, CCP virus. Uh, I think I can see evidence of the world, uh, politicians, governments, peoples in liberal democracies starting to put on their thinking caps uh, and trying to do something along this line. For example, I have seen um, some um, uh, empirical uh, uh, huge data analysis uh, done in 19 countries, I think, tracing uh, back to patient zero of the virus. Uh, outbreak in the individual countries, and they trace it back to uh, a person from Wuhan. Uh, and also, uh, I think some Indian uh, jurists are already uh, uh, asking the uh, United Nations to make uh, uh, China, or in other words, the CCP, uh, pay for uh, the huge uh, loss and damage suffered. And the Henry Jackson Society, a uh, very reputable think tank in London, uh, published a report that goes to about 50, 60 pages to suggest that uh, there are causes of action open to victims of the CCP virus uh, so that they can pursue uh, China 
for uh, compensation. Uh, and lastly, uh, only last week, I saw a piece of news to say that the International Criminal Court already received an application for um, bringing uh, China to justice uh, in that court, uh, something that can be likened to uh, war crime. Right? Uh, so it seems that uh, the CCP and President Xi Jinping are finding themselves in a very dire situation that it seems that the whole world is coming down on them. But what bewilders me is that it seems the CCP and uh, President Xi Jinping are not responding or reacting in a way that... Uh, uh, a rational being would expect them to. Uh, instead of apologizing to the world for uh, having uh, done wrong, they are now um, putting out uh, different allegations and accusations to say, firstly, that it, 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 it was uh, American soldiers uh bringing the virus to Wuhan then they actually suggested also that it could be Italy that uh, first uh, spread the uh, virus through Chinese personnel uh, to China now all these I don't think will help them in uh, possibly regaining the trust, of uh, the world. And if such trust cannot be earned once again, then not only the CCP will face very dire consequences, Hong Kong will also go down with, with it. Uh, you might be aware that um, uh, there was uh, this news about, uh, is it Google? Um, they are laying a, an, 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 uh, a, a, a cable uh, which originally was planned to go via Taiwan to Hong Kong. Uh, but now uh, I think uh, they would stop at Taiwan and the reason for that is that Hong Kong is no longer trusted as a member of the free world. So that um, if the cable goes to Hong Kong, it could actually jeopardize all the data and information conveyed in that uh, uh, seabed cable. And that is a very sad thing uh, for Hong Kongers to... to uh, to note, um, because we have been promised uh, independent customs territory status uh, since 1992 by the Hong Kong Policy Act passed by uh, the American Congress. Uh, but now it seems that we are brought down by uh, the CCP when the world has uh, awakened to the CCP threat and Hong Kong uh, is uh, <laughs> no longer trusted as uh, an autonomous region that can manage our own business um, uh, and honor our treaty and contract uh, obligations. Uh, with the rest of the world. That is a sad thing. You know, it just brings two questions to my mind, actually. You know, first of all, the, and I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll say them both. First of all, are you worried that because of, uh, you know, the way the CCP is acting or the awareness of the way that CCP is acting um, around the world, around global governments, and especially in the U.S., will result in the special status of Hong Kong being revoked 
which of course would be a very difficult situation. That's one. And two, um, there are the types of legislation, or sorry, the types of court cases that you were talking about earlier, holding the CCP accountable. There's actually being legislation being introduced in the U.S. right now to this effect. There's a number of lawsuits that uh, we've been covering that also seek to seek damages around this. Um, but there's also the criticism of this legislation and these lawsuits is simply um, th it's too early to try to deal with this. Let's deal, deal with the problem first, lay blame later. What would you say to people that, uh, that have that criticism? Well, uh, there is a saying in Hong Kong that uh, if we burn, the CCP burns with us. <laughs> well, it, it seems that uh, unfortunately we may be heading that way. If Hong Kong is no longer trusted as uh, an autonomous uh, special administrative region that uh, is given a free hand to manage our own business, um, then Hong Kong will be treated by the rest of the world as no different from Shanghai or Guangzhou. Now, so uh, if that is the case, then Hong Kong uh, is very, very difficult for Hong Kong to um, maintain our status as an international financial center. Um, and of course, with such a status of uh, uh, at International Financial Center gone, then I really question how the CCP could uh, um, uh, recruit um, or to attract foreign investments directly into China, and also how uh, it could exchange uh, renminbi into uh, internationally traded uh, foreign currencies. So it is um, really difficult to answer why the CCP and President Xi are behaving in a way that is beyond logical comprehension, unless they actually want to burn Hong Kong and that, and then they burn with us. But that doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, and the only way that I can explain it is that they, out of power, conceitedness, uh, they just can't help themselves uh, <laughs> into uh, behaving in this way, uh, which is totally irrational, if you ask me. Um, and I think uh, peoples of the world should uh, see in the example of Hong Kong people over the past decade or so that um, when you think that there is really no hope uh, at all by standing to uh, the CCP, uh, sometimes by insisting on what you believe to be uh, the right thing to do, uh, somehow things might work out. Now, of course, I'm not saying that things are working out at the moment, but at least uh, 20 years ago, when we were faced with the Article 23 saga, People already said, uh, as a matter of uh, undeniable fate, that Hong Kong was no match for the CCP. There's no good for the people of Hong Kong uh, to stand up uh, against the making of the national security laws. But of course, as history has it, we have defended ourselves against that law, that draconian law, which originally was uh, meant to take away our freedoms, our 
human rights and rule of law, uh, we have at least postponed that evil day for 18 years now, right? And uh, we also um, did very well in November in the district council elections. Everybody thought that uh, probably the CCP and the Hong Kong administration would cancel that uh, election, uh, the district council elections. But it turned out that the Democrats won a landslide victory. We won 388 seats out of a total of 420, and we are now controlling 17 out of 18 district councils. So there is um, a silver lining behind uh, these dark cloud, it seems, looming over Hong Kong. Uh, and for that purpose, looming over the world. But uh, if we uh, insist on living in truth and we um, practice a good comradeship and we practice what we believe to be human values, uh, I, I think there's no need to feel and act desperate uh, and and yeah just keep it up and hang in there and uh, do our best you know based on what you've just said i'm guessing i know the answer to the other question which is uh whether it's appropriate to seek uh restitution and damages in this legislation uh, to hold the ccp accountable at this time but i'll let you answer <laughs> Well, uh, you see, Yan, uh, given previous uh, uh, examples of the CCP having been taken to international arena, uh, they invariably would say, uh, even they lost these uh, legal battles, uh, they would say, oh, this is uh, a... a a question of uh, our own sovereignty. We are not going to yield to international courts ruling, etc. So I think uh, these moves totally understandable, uh, but I don't think it will produce the results that uh, the pursuers intend. But that is not really telling them not to continue to pursue them, I think it is important for um, us who believe in a rules-based game uh, or order of things to uh, do what we think ought to be done. But I, I'm not optimistic at all that uh, you would be able to get the redress and remedy or compensation from the CCP by pursuing such courses. You know, um, you're a, a very keen legal mind. I'll just mention, you know, one one of the, the lawyers that's on one of these cases, he has actually successfully extracted multiple millions from uh, nationalized uh, uh, CCP, obviously ultimately governed company. I, th I believe the judge in the case basically threatened uh, to stop port calls for Chinese ships and, unless they paid up uh, ultimately um, and so forth. So this, so there, there are. It seems like there are uh, methods other than um, saying, you know, give me the money, and the CCP saying, ah, no thanks, we're sovereign. Well, yeah. Well, you are right. If uh, there are assets of CCP within your jurisdiction, then that is, of course, a different question. Uh, but uh, you can only have your remedy as much as you have CCP's assets within your jurisdiction. Uh, so, well, do what you think is right. Uh, don't despair and give up too soon. <laughs> well, that's, that, those are those are wonderful words to hear. I think, in general, for uh, these you know very very difficult times. Um, 
Um, of course, uh, you know, again, I've said this before, but my heart, you know, our hearts here go out to the Hong Kong people, setting a great example um, uh, for the rest of the world, you know, holding tight, uh, you know, in the face of a lot of adversity and not just coronavirus. Obviously, this is what we've been discussing today. Um, uh, any final thoughts before we finish up? Well, I really hope that uh, the world will spare us some attention uh, during these difficult times when uh, you are fighting against the coronavirus. Uh, Hong Kong is really on the front line of this uh, battle between the China model and the liberal democratic model. If uh, Hong Kong falls as a result of uh, uh, the world no longer paying enough attention to us during this uh, time of the viral attack, then if Hong Kong falls, uh, it uh, may <laughs> produce uh, similar uh, uh, results in other countries who uh, have been dealing with the CCP. So it, it may be high time that we all uh, uh, set back and, 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 and thought about how we would um, deal with uh, the CCP uh, after the uh, virus has uh, somehow been controlled. And I can say with some certainty that there would be a new order of things. Uh, life will not go back to the time before the coronavirus. Uh, it is not possible and it is something that God forbids. Well, Alan Leong, such a pleasure to speak with you today. Pleasure's all mine.